Uh, could you please introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Dr. Allison Ash. Everybody calls me Allie. And I am a sociologist, a sex and intimacy coach and educator, and the founder of TurnOn.Love. Awesome. <laughs> I'm so pumped to be talking with you about, uh, well, about a lot of different things, but you have a workshop a workshop that you have been running mm -hmm. called Sleaze Free Seduction. That's right. Uh, is there a tagline to it? Uh, Sleaze Free Seduction Skills. Yeah, it's about how to seduce others in a way that is effective, appropriate, and authentic. Effective, appropriate, and authentic. I feel like those yeah. are three keys to seduction. <laughs> and I'd say so. Yeah, and I'm... You know, it's funny, I was just thinking about, or I was reading today's New York Times about Joe Biden, right? Uh -huh. And it seems like a really good segue because what is inappropriate for somebody is not inappropriate for somebody else. That's right. And the way he's been hugging all sorts of people, some people find it, they're, they're okay with it. They find it comforting, they find it charming, they like it, it's encouraging, and to other people, it's creepy. And that's confusing. You know, I, I have so much empathy for how hard it is to date in our, I mean, I'm, I'm a part of it. It is challenging being in this dating world because being a human is messy and intimacy is not always clear cut. And creepiness is subjective, right? When we, there are certainly things that I can talk about that most people will find creepy, right? So there is some consensus around that, but our experiences are um, filtered through the lens of all of our past experiences, right? So our interpretation of somebody else's actions aren't going to be the same as everybody else's in the room because we have all had a different history of experiences that have led to our interpretation of the present moment. And so one of the things that I wanna tell people is that even if you come to this workshop, even if you do everything that you could possibly do to never be creepy again, you're still gonna be creepy to someone sometime because that's just the way of the world. And so one thing that I really wanna advocate for is how do you clean it up when that happens and how do you create reconnection when there's a disconnection? It, uh, the ability to repair is what I mean. I'm I'm learning that the ability to repair is one of the most important things in being able to maintain connection and stay in a relationship with mm -hmm. people. I find that I'm always kind of holding my breath a little bit in relationships that are new until we have our first repair, because I want to know that there's that commitment to the process and that I can trust them to hold me with empathy and compassion, and that we're both committed to working through those inevitable rough patches and hurt feelings and um messiness that happens when we open ourselves up to being vulnerable and loving others. Yeah. And you're, what you're talking about is, is, you know, in the, the context of a new relationship, what about like when we don't even know each other, right? Like yeah. step, step one, ground zero can be so challenging. Mm -hmm. And even as someone who's had some quite a bit of experience flirting with, with people, I sometimes don't know how to act. Yeah. I think one of the sweetest ways to create safety is to name the elephant in the room. And if somebody came up to me and they said, oh, I'm noticing I'm a little flustered around you. I just, um, I'm finding you so attractive. I'm a little bit, I lost my words. Like there's something really endearing about that, right? It's just like, it's already happening. You're already in front of somebody. You're a little flustered. You lost your words. Like what if you just name it? I remember once I was um, flirting with this woman and it's, I'm queer. I date people of all genders. And, um, but it's, it's a little bit interesting flirting with a woman because there's not the same social scripts that are there in a hetero world. And so it's always a little bit of trying to figure out how, how to make it happen. And I was flirting with this woman for a while. And then at one point I said, I just want to say that I get to this point with women where I really like them and then I'm not sure how to take it to the next step. And I just don't want to do that with you. Now is the elephant in the room. And it took us to the next step, right? And so there's just a way that it can create some softness and transparency. And I think one of the best ways to, um, to have people feel safe is to be transparent. And one of the things that makes a lot of people feel creeped out is a lack of transparency. I wrote this blog post. I used to write blogs a few years ago, and I wrote one called The Perfect Pickup. Uh -huh. <laughs> and the perfect pickup line is the elephant in the room. 
where you go up to somebody and you say, hey, I would really like to introduce myself to you. I don't really know how to do it. I'm kind of nervous, but I decided to just do it anyways to see mm -hmm. what happened. <laughs> yeah, I, even just hearing you give me the example, I'm smiling so huge because I just really, it's so refreshing to just have somebody be willing to be that honest. And you don't have to remember any special pickup lines. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Right. It's just what is authentic and real to you right then. But the problem is that we are not taught this, right? We're taught to be cool. We're taught to be suave, to have a cool pickup line That's right. and to impress people. And it is, it's hard to impress people, first of all, number one, and what works with one person doesn't necessarily work with another person. Mm -hmm. And it's even harder to impress people if you're trying to impress them. Yeah, <laughs> this works against you. So how what's another example of uh, the elephant in the room that could work in in like a different context? Like what are some examples that we can give to people so they can actually use this stuff? Yeah, well, I think that when with the men that I've worked with. Or just generally with people that I've worked with, I've seen a lack of transparency in two realms. One is around vulnerability or your emotional experience. And one is around your desire. And when you think about like the alpha man or the stereotypical guy, right? Uh, men have been socialized to believe that emotions and are, are a sign of vulnerability and weakness and that being vulnerable is weak, right? And so they're much more likely to hide their emotional experience, which is a form of, um, it's a lack of transparency that can create a feeling of discomfort because you don't really know where the other one is at and you can't consent to things that aren't being clearly communicated, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then there's kind of what I term the nice guy, which I think people of all genders can fall in that category, which is the reaction against that, right? I don't want to be that guy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to minimize or hide my desire so that you feel safe, right? I'm doing it for you. But that repression of desire actually also comes across as creepy sometimes because there's this unnamed thing that's there that's not being communicated. And so when we talk about naming the elephant in the room, if it's around vulnerability and emotions, it could be something like, I don't really have a lot of practice being vulnerable. And it's something that I'm learning and I'm working on. And... I want to be more vulnerable with you and hopefully we can explore how we can create that together, right? And if you want to name the elephant in the room around your desire, it could be something like, when I look at you, my body just is running with sensations and feelings and I feel totally flustered and like I'm 16 again. Right? Like there's something just really beautiful about that. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I am attracted to you and I don't know why or, or what it could lead to because I don't know you. Yeah. But I wanted to see if there was an opportunity for us to get to know each other. Totally. Yeah. You, when you mentioned, you know, vulnerability and being authentic, it reminded me of, of something that happened to me last night, which was that I was seeing someone that I've been seeing for a long time, but very sporadically. And somebody that I would really like to be in a relationship with, but who's also in a relationship with somebody else. And mm -hmm. it's an open relationship, but there are some blocks there that are pr really preventing us from really exploring what a relationship together would look like. And I, and I said to her, I would really like to explore like what us spending more time together would look like. And... I'm not in a position, I've never really been in a position to want to explore that with someone who doesn't also want to explore that with me. And it's hard for me to be honest about the fact that like, I would really like this and also to know that you're not really available for it. Mm. And she looked at me and she goes, well, first of all, I actually really never knew you felt that way. Cause I never told her because I was scared of what the answer was going to be. So, that's there's a risk when you're vulnerable is that you're going to get an answer that you don't want to get but at the same time now she knows how i feel and there's no more lack of clarity around my feelings and i get the impression that it's that lack of clarity that really makes people anxious 
mm-hmm. in a seduction or an attraction or a dating context. Yes. They don't really know what's going on and that can prevent people from feeling safe. I, I love that you were able to be that vulnerable with her. And I imagine that no matter where your relationship heads, that there's going to be a sense of closeness that can come from that experience because there's that vulnerability that was held tenderly and well received. Um, I think that it's really important to also name what you are a yes to, right? I often talk about um, finding the Venn diagram of your shared yeses. Because I know that for me, for much of my life, if I could tell that somebody was interested in me, and particularly if a man was interested in me and I wasn't interested or as interested, I would put up a wall because I wouldn't want to be a tease or lead him on. And it's only been in the last, I don't know, maybe five, six years that I've learned, well, maybe this human is actually super open to connecting with me as friends or in other contexts, and I'm not even giving them the opportunity because I don't want to be this tease. And instead, what if I can just hold space for the fact that maybe this person does want to have other kinds of relationships with me, even if I'm not available for something sexual or romantic. And so when I, one of the things that I teach in Sleeves Free Seduction Skills is how to do what's called a three-part invitation. And this is a form of verbal flirting where you're inviting their desire, that's part one. Then you're naming your own desire that's part two. And then you're giving a way out. That's part three. So that you're really making as much space for their authentic experience as possible. So for example, um, if you're interested in getting together after the show, I would love to talk with you more off camera and see what kind of chemistry we might have. And if you want to keep this professional, I'm so grateful to have this relationship and to continue to collaborate in this way. I mean, there's no wrong answer. Mm -hmm. I don't feel cornered. I don't feel like what you did was or said was inappropriate. You've expressed your desire in a way that's very clear. And you've also said, hey, it's totally cool for us to just stay on this road. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that when you can really welcome somebody's no, it changes everything. Because here's the thing. We live in a very like goal-oriented, success-driven culture. And so what happens is, is that oftentimes we have an agenda, which means that we have expectations and pressure. And that's another thing that can really have people feel creeped out is when there's pressure. I always say that there are three major boner killers, regardless of your genitalia. These are boner killers for every human that I know, which is stress, pressure, and shame. And so we want to take the pressure out of the scenario, right? And so what I like about the three-part invite is it's making total space for somebody's no. And so it relieves the pressure. And I think that that actually invites people's yes. And I know from experience that when I can really welcome somebody's no, they're going to be a lot more likely to explore their maybes with me because they know if their maybe becomes a no, I'll respect it right away. And I think so much of the juiciness of sex can come from when we feel safe to explore our maybes and not just go with the sure thing. And so when somebody says no to me, I always say thank you both because I want to communicate to them that it's safe to say no to me and because it's a reminder to myself that they're giving me a gift by trusting me with their no and I don't want to drop that, right? Because we think of no's as a rejection, but I think, I mean, sometimes they are, sometimes it's a closing of the door, but most often a no is a bid for intimacy. It's a, can I be a no to something and will you still want to be in connection with me? You know, and I have to say that one of the things that I just see that perpetuates the gender trauma in our society is that men are put in in the position of having to initiate, which means that they experience a lot more rejection. 
And so they get a no and every no carries the weight of all, every no before it, all of those rejections. And so they feel hurt and wounded and they disconnect. And what that disconnection does is it communicates to women that the only thing they're valued for is their sex. And that is just such a painful experience to be on the other side of. And both people are feeling really wounded in that situation because there's such a disconnection in the face of a no that makes it feel like people aren't, uh, that they, it, it, you know, when we can just welcome a no and stay in connection in the face of it and figure out what else is possible, all of that can just melt away. It's, I could, I have so many things to say about this. Uh, for me, a no is actually very liberating because I like to live in clarity. And if you're a no to me, then thank you so much for letting me know. I can either see if there's another thing that we can do, another way for us to connect that's not the intended connection. Uh, I could disengage like lovingly and say, thank you. I'm really looking for a sexual partner right now. And I just don't see this as a fit as anything else. So thank you so much for letting me know. So there's sort of a, a freedom of, there's just more energy available for what it is that I want. That's right. Yeah. Um, the, th but there was, there was another, there was multiple. <laughs> <laughs> The three, I like the three part invitation. I knew about the, the two part invitation, but that, that third part with the exit is so powerful. Mm -hmm. And it's important that it's authentic, right? You don't want to give something that's like, and if you're not into it, that's cool, I guess. <laughs> right. But you know, um, if you're available, I would really love your number. And if you're not, I just wanted you to know that I think that you're a really compelling person. <laughs> I have, so I sent an email uh, or a Facebook message many, 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 probably last year to a woman that I had met at a community space and who worked there and I was a volunteer there and I sent her a message and I said, Hey, I just want to let you know, I've been really enjoying getting to know you. Uh, if you're single, available and interested, I would love to take you on a date. Maybe we can go walk the dog or drink some tea. If for some reason this is totally a breach of community guidelines, then my apologies. I didn't mean to step on any toes. I just wanted to express how awesome I think you are. I love that. <laughs> yes, that's so, oh my goodness. I could just imagine getting that email and it wouldn't matter what my feelings were. I would feel totally touched and honored to receive it. That's what she wrote back. Hmm. She said, I'm in a relationship, so I'm totally not available, but I love this message. Yeah. And if I think of anybody who might be a good fit for you, I'll let you know. <laughs> Even better. <laughs> it's good networking. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, and I can imagine that it's hard for people to be that direct with what it is that they want. Well, and I mean, let's just even back up a step and acknowledge that a lot of people have a hard time figuring out what it is that they want, right? And I think especially for people that have repressed their desire for a long time, you know, a lot of men have gotten the message that their desire is wrong, scary, dangerous, inappropriate, um, yet they're supposed to always be available for sex. It's a really confusing message. Um, and I work with a lot of guys that let so many opportunities pass by because they don't know how to act on them in a way that's appropriate. And that's also incredibly disempowering and not serving anyone. And part of my work with them is helping them touch into their desire, feel it, be witnessed in it, have a de-shaming, de-shamifying experience around it, know that they can be a human with desire and that it's not scary or dangerous or wrong. Um, and so it, we're coming sometimes from different angles with people around what are the blockages that they have that can prevent them from being able to be that communicative. What are some of the blockages? I mean, where does it, where does it, where do the, where do some of these come from? Well, I think that it's different for men and women because of the way that we socialize girls and boys. 
right? Girls are socialized to be emotional caretakers. We have intimacy with our um, friends from a really early age, um, but we're not really socialized to explore our bodies. We don't talk about masturbation often in our sex health classes. We are not taught the anatomy of the clitoris. Um, in the UK, you can have sex legally at 16, I think, but you can't buy a dildo until you're 18. So we're not really creating the conditions for girls and women to explore their bodies and know what they want. So I think when it comes to pleasure, um, what it is that they can ask for, um, I'm often finding that they don't quite know yet because they haven't had the chance to explore. On top of that, we know that men have been socialized to believe that they need to be competent at everything, especially when it comes to sex. And so a lot of women are going to subjugate their pleasure and prioritize the emotional well-being of their partner by not asking for what they want, even if they know it, because they're worried that he's going to feel criticized or judged or not enough. It's funny. I was watching one of your videos about how to eat pussy like a champ. Uh-huh. And uh, and I, I wrote a, a blog called uh, What Women Wish You Knew About, about Eating Pussy. And then I turned it into a, then I was uh, interviewed by, by, um, shameless sex podcast about that issue. And mm-hmm. then we did another episode on, on, um, blowjobs, but you know, one of the really important pieces of how to be a, a champ at eating pussy and the five things that people wish you knew about it is that like communication is it's required in order mm-hmm. to have fulfilling, satisfying, excellent oral sex. That's right. And I would love, I mean, the more direction you can give me, the better. And in How to Eat Pussy Like a Champ, I talk about how you can communicate before, during, and after, and how you can communicate both verbally and non-verbally. And when you think about that, even if you lose your words during sex, you can still manage to communicate non-verbally and then use your verbal communication before and after to explain more of what's going on for you when it's hard for you to communicate. Because a lot of people are like, ah, words, pleasure, they don't mix. Um, But I think debriefing is sexy and nothing is hotter for me than laying in the arms of my lover after a long lovemaking session and we like share frames of what was hot and sexy and yummy. And I mean, that's just, or what we want to try or do different next time. I think that can be really intimate. Uh, Yeah, (laughs) that sounds really intimate and not something that I have a lot of experience in. There's, I don't have a lot of debrief experience, but I like it and I want to incorporate it. Uh, Can I give you one of my favorite ways of doing it? It's a little kinky and super fun. Absolutely. Okay. So um, I'll tell my partner, pretend that you're talking to your best friend. Describe to him or her what just happened and refer to me in third person. So I'm kind of like like getting this um, uh, replay of the experience through their lens of how they saw it, what stuck out to them. And then there's just like this little added fun element of like pretending that they're telling somebody else about it. I'm a fly on the wall and I get to hear how they think and, and see me. I don't know. There's something that just really lights me up about, about doing it that way. I love that. And I would be hard pressed to tell my, f- my male friend the, the details or be that descriptive in what happened during lovemaking. That's, that might be fair. So then if you were my partner, I would say, pretend you're writing a trashy Harlequin romance novel describing the sex we just had. What would you say? I, this would be challenging, but I think that the, the more you do it, the easier it gets. Yeah, and you know, sometimes it's just a frame. Start there. What was one image that, st- that stands out to you? Yeah. Okay. One part that was like, really hot and also lead by example when i'm doing this i'll often say oh i really loved it when you did this or i'm constantly wanting to expand my repertoire so if somebody does something i'm not quite sure what they did and i like it i'll be like what was that thing you did right then like can you show me or something like that right and if you can start by leading and being vulnerable and sharing what you liked it creates permission it's an invitation for other people to meet you there that is that's just like when we are intimate and vulnerable and authentic and transparent, it gives other people the opportunity to do it because they know that you felt safe enough to go there 
And so that it must be, you must be creating a safe space. Mm -hmm. For me, when I talk about sexual health, I'm often the first person to bring it up. Yes. And I just, and that's why I, I just have to say that I think vulnerability is one of the most courageous ways that you could be. And it's just such a illusion that we've created in our society that vulnerability is weakness because the first person who is being vulnerable is taking on the risk of being hurt or rejected because they're revealing who they are and they're doing it to create more comfort and safety and permission for you. That is a hugely courageous gift. So when somebody leads by vulnerability, I'm like, yeah, go for it. I just instantly feel more compelled to interact and be close with them. Mm. And it's a big piece in making people feel safe Mm -hmm. and making people feel safe. I was reading uh, Naomi Wolf's book, Vagina. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. And, you know, she she says that like one of the key uh, indicators of whether someone's going to be turned on and aroused is safety, especially women. Mm-hmm. That without safety, it's very, very hard to get aroused. Mm-hmm. That's right. In sleaze free seduction skills, I define seduction as turn on, as part of me, safety plus turn on. You have to start by creating safety, and that can create the conditions for you to create turn on. And that you're always calibrating and titrating between the two. That if your pacing is too quick, you're going to have a lot of turn on, but not enough safety, and the walls are going to come up. And if your pace is too slow, you might have a lot of safety, but you're not going to have enough turn on. So it's finding the balance between it, right? So learning how to navigate consent fluently, welcoming people's no's. I really also advocate for having meta consent conversations. Tell me more. (laughs) Okay. So um, I know that there's a lot of people out there when nothing has them feel sexier or more turned on than when somebody's asking them every step of the way, may I, can I, would you like it if? And I know a lot of people out there where that puts them in the head, where it disconnects them from their body or their pleasure, where it feels disjointed or awkward, and they don't want to be asked, can I touch your boob, can I take your shirt off, etc. So how is anybody supposed to know how to operate consent if you might similarly be either offending somebody or turning them off, right? Uh, by not doing consent well or in the way that somebody else wants you to navigate it. So what I advocate for is having a meta consent conversation. So maybe after I've been like having a little bit of intimacy, I can tell that there's some mutual turn on and desire. I might say something like, um, I would just love to talk openly about how you like to be how you would like to navigate consent and if you feel safer when I ask every step of the way or if you feel comfortable communicating your yes or no's or what would make it feel more comfortable for you to ask for what you want and to say no to me and just to name that and when I when I've had these conversations you know I get to say I feel really comfortable with my yeses and no's and I really like to be in flow and so you know, these are the things that would feel really comfortable for you to ask me about first. And otherwise, let's just be in flow. And if something isn't working, I'll be sure to tell you. Um, And I know a lot of other people that are like, oh, thank you so much for asking. I would really like it in the beginning if you could just keep on asking because it makes me feel really comfortable with you. Meta consent. This is both mind blowing and totally obvious. (laughs) Right. And it totally takes Mm -hmm. all of the stress out of it. Yeah. Because I was talking to a friend yesterday and he, and he goes, man, I don't know how to act anymore. You know, do I lean in for the kiss? Do I ask for the kiss? Do I ask it at every step? Like, it's not romantic anymore. I'm scared. I don't, I don't want to fuck up, but I'm going to fuck up. Mm-hmm. And as someone who has a background in communication and who's done a lot of therapy, I just know that the more you talk and share, the more they will share. Mm-hmm. And sure, you can... You can talk your way out of having sex. Like it, it can be that unsexy to really go down to that level. But the meta the meta consent conversation sort of sort of regulates that. Right. And you can have the meta consent conversation when you're like cuddling and hanging out. And then when you're like making out and you're escalating, you already have that safety 
that container of safety created that can allow it to feel less disjointed when you're actually in those moments of sexual intimacy and escalation. I learned something last year of a practice called desires, fears, and boundaries. Hmm. Tell me. Yeah, cool. Same, same idea before anything explicit happens. Uh, we, we can share what our desires, fears, and boundaries are. So my desire would be to explore what getting naked with you would feel like and look like. Uh, my fear is that I, that you won't find me sexy because I've gained a few pounds in the last several months and I don't, I don't feel super sexy. And my boundary is that I don't want any sort of penetrative sex, but I'm willing to explore, you know, anything close to that. And then they can tell me what their desires, fears, and boundaries are. And, and now we, it's actually really clear what's available. Mm-hmm. There's no more fear of like, oh, am I going to go too far? Right. Am I going right. to try to put my hand down their pants and they're going to go, no, 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 I don't want that. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it creates more safety. Yeah. And it helps you figure out where your overlapping yeses lie. Yeah. What if you want to get naked and you also don't want to penetrate penetration and you also feel a little iffy about your body? Right. Or maybe I could say something like, um, I have a desire to be naked too. And my fear is that, um, my fear is that you won't like my breasts because they're small. And my boundary is that I want to get as close to touching without actually touching. (laughs) <laughs> and in which I could say, oh my God, I love small breasts. I actually prefer them. Yeah. And then I would feel so much safer with you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm getting the impression that like talking is really, really can like calm the nervous system down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And when that happens, we can excite the nervous system in a different way. That's right. That's right. And I think that being attuned in your pacing is really, really important. And so if you're feeling somebody as tense or disconnected or something feels off, like slow down, name it. I'm feeling some disconnection. I'm wondering if you are too. I want us to feel really connected. And to just make this space to have these kinds of conversations. Oh, I'm not feeling disconnected. I actually just, I close my eyes when I feel this sort of, pleasure and it can look like I'm disconnected, but I'm really connected. Ah, I love that. Maybe you could um, tap my body with your hand when you're really enjoying something so I know that you're with me. (laughs) I can definitely do that. (laughs) I love it. Mm -hmm. A thing you said earlier uh, about, you know, playing with that kind of the, not the gray zone, but the maybes, Mm -hmm. how playing with the maybes can be really exciting. Yeah. I heard someone say that, um, when you're with someone who really respects your boundaries, your boundaries actually kind of soften. Yeah. Because you don't have to be the only one that's enforcing them. Right. If I feel like I am the gatekeeper and you're trying to get your ball in my goal and my goal is to not let your ball in my goal, then I'm going to insert as firm of a wall and boundary as I possibly can. But if I feel like you're on my team and you're not going to let anything get in my gate until I want it, then I can relax that and I know that we're holding it together. I want you to be a fuck yes to me getting my ball in your goal. (laughs) <laughs> the best pleasure is when it's pleasurable for everybody involved. This seems obvious. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it does. But you know what? It's not for so many folks. It's not. We have to name it. What about... We all know that consent is super important. And I also get the impression that sometimes women in particular have a hard time saying no. And like really feeling safe enough to say no. And so I've had conversations with guys that just don't know how to, how to deal with that. Like they want to be respectful, but they also don't really trust that the person they're with 
can like advocate for their needs. And so that just creates kind of a murky situation where people don't really know what the fuck is going on. Yep. Yeah. And again, like what a beautiful opportunity to name the elephant in the room. So in this example, if I was that person, I would say something to the effect of, I'm noticing that I'm not entirely certain that you feel as comfortable saying no as I would want people in my life to be with me. I really want you to feel comfortable to say no with me because then I feel more comfortable asking you for things and I don't have to make decisions about whether or not you're really a yes or a no and filter what I share with you. And I'm curious how comfortable you feel saying no to me. And I wonder if there's anything that I can do that would make it more comfortable for you or make it easier for you to say no to me. Um, because I really want this to feel as yummy for you as possible, as yummy for both of us as possible. Sleaze-free seduction. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What you just demonstrated also takes uh, an amount of letting go of your expectations around what sex looks like yeah. and letting go of your goal, mm -hmm. which is something that I've done in the last several years. Like I, I mean, I'm older now. I'm in my late, mid, mid thirties. So I, I'm just like, there's less libido it just happens, but I'm also way less attached to the outcome of what a date is going to end up like. I might think that day, Oh, it'd be really awesome to have sex. But if during the date, uh, the person only wants to explore naked, no touch cuddling, <laughs> then I'm totally down to explore naked, no touch cuddling. Talk about anticipation, right? Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but prior, you know, earlier in my twenties, I would have wanted to have sex and I would have been really disappointed. Mm -hmm. And I would have probably not used all the language you just demonstrated because maybe I wouldn't get what I wanted. That's right. And that's why I think really dropping your agenda is going to help you have so many more experiences that are pleasurable and connected, right? And also another thing that I really want to educate folks on is this idea. Um, so I borrow this term from the tech community. I'm in the Bay Area, so I see a lot of techie clients. And there's this term called last known good state which forgive me if you're a tech person out there because I'm not, and I might be um, totally butchering the definition. Um, but for me, what I, when I hear that, it's like if something goes awry, don't just scrap it all together. Go back to the last condition that worked well and play there for a little bit. And so when you're flirting and you're escalating, um, and you're, you know, you're getting yeses and it's getting hotter and you're going up the ladder and it's getting more and more intense and then you hit a no, don't just disconnect and see peace. I'm out of here. I feel rejected. My wall's up. I don't want to do anything with you anymore. Go back to the last thing that worked. So maybe you try and take my shirt off and I push your hand away, but we're grinding and kissing and making out and that feels good. Great. Go back to the kissing and grinding and making out. And what that does is that communicates to me that you are tracking me, that you can uh, read and respect my boundaries, that you're willing to meet me where I'm at. And that's going to soften the boundaries like we talked about earlier and make it more likely, if not then, then maybe in the future, that I am willing to escalate with you more because I feel like re fully respected in that moment. Yeah, I love that last known good state. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that just makes me, like reminds me that I wanted to ask you about like how do we approach the first kiss? Yeah. And one thing that I've been advocating for is that that the lean in first kiss is over. Like, ah, okay. I'm not even, I'm not even going for a lean in. I don't care how strong the signs are. Well, that's not actually true. <laughs> if the signs are strong, if the nonverbal is really, really strong, I am fairly tuned into the person, right? There is a way to, there is a way to do it. But I also think that it's really dangerous to tell people, okay, just read the nonverbal. Because sometimes the nonverbal isn't clear at all. And what mm -hmm. works with one person isn't going to work with another. And so I can't advocate anything but asking for the first kiss. 
because that that's clear and it's clean and it it allows for someone to say no because I don't ever want to put somebody in a position where I lean in and they lean away. Okay, can I offer a counterpoint? Totally. Okay. <laughs> of course. I teach something called the almost kiss. <laughs> And I'm going to try and uh, describe it and teach it through this video chat medium and we'll see how it works. But um, I think that, let me just back up a step and say that yes, asking for verbal consent before a first kiss is totally appropriate if you're ever unsure, if that's what makes you feel safer, if, if for any reason that's your decision, great decision. I also want to offer this non-verbal way of getting consent for a kiss and it has to be done in a way that is making space for somebody's exit and no at every step of the way. So don't ever do the almost kiss if somebody has a wall or a couch or a human behind them. You only wanna do the almost kiss if they have space to back up, okay? This is really important and because even just like um, kinesthetically, somebody can sense if something's behind them and they're gonna start to feel trapped. So just like to create safety, right? Think about how you would pet a cat. You're not gonna corner it, you're gonna give them a way out, okay? So the almost kiss. The thing that I would encourage that you do first is you look at the other person's lips. You just like look at them a little bit and then you look back at their eyes. <laughs> and then maybe you look back at their lips a little bit and then you look back at their eyes. And if you do that a few times, they're gonna know what you're thinking. Okay? And if they don't want to kiss you, they're going to change the conversation to something sterile or they're going to shift their body or they're going to lean away or they're going to get on their phone or they're going to go around the room or they're going to disconnect from you with their body language. And so the almost kiss has to be done very, very slowly, not rushed, so that you both leave space for these cues to show up and so that you can be observant enough to track for them. Okay, but so you're just, you're not moving your body at all. You're not moving towards them. You're not changing the space between them. You're just starting by looking at their lips. If they start to smile or get flirty or look at your lips back, or maybe they're subconsciously going to lick their own lips or bite them, then you're getting a little bit of this energetic buy-in. Okay, the next step of the almost kiss is to lick or bite your own lip. And if you feel awkward doing this, go home and practice in the mirror. You just did a really great lip bite. I saw it, okay? And some people have a more natural bite and some people have a more natural lick. So just go home and practice in the mirror. I do personally this like kind of lick bite combo motion, okay? Play with it till it feels natural. So then you're gonna be looking at somebody you're looking at them at the lips, then maybe you're playing with your lip while you look at them at the lip, but you're still keeping the same amount of space and distance between you. I know that this sounds so formulaic, but I have to tell you, it really works. Okay, so you're still tracking to get their buy-in, okay? There might, they, you, you might notice that they lean in a little bit or that they get really flirty or that they cock their head and reveal the side of their neck, which is like a prime flirty motion, or they start preening with their hair or kind of doing one of these motions, right? So then what I advocate for is leaning in a little bit. I'm talking about three degrees. So minor, okay, just a little lean in. And notice what they do. Do they stay still and rigid? Okay, back up. Go back to the last known good state. Do they back away? Okay, go back to the last known good state. Don't disconnect entirely. You haven't actually initiated anything that requires you to undo. You've just flirted a little bit. Go back to talking about whatever you were talking about. But if you lean in three degrees and they lean in, right, then you're getting more energetic buy-in. So then what it would be like if you leaned in just a little bit more. And then I really, I like this idea that you only get one first kiss. So what is it like if you actually do it where you're like leaning in and you're just like hovering in this space between like, we're not kissing, but we're almost kissing. And if they don't want to kiss you, they'll back away. They have utter space to back away. But the confidence that it takes to go that slow and to leave space for somebody to say no or back away and to linger and maybe just like, oh, I love it when there's just so much tension, you don't know who's going to cave first and just make the kiss land. It's just so hot, right? It's so, so good. And like maybe you're just kind of like, 
grazing your lips a little bit, but you're not really kissing, or sometimes I'll like flick it with my tongue a little bit. There's just something so juicy and yummy about the anticipation and the confidence that it takes to, and the, and the attunement, the tracking that it takes and to be able to do that in such a slow, inviting, seductive, enticing way. Wow. wow. <laughs> I got to say, this is sort of like a masterclass move. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm glad that you're teaching it to, to everybody, you know? Yeah. Uh, you're right. There is no retake on the first kiss. Mm -hmm. And asking or expressing desire verbally can tamper a little bit of that energy. Right. Well, and hopefully you're not almost kissing out of the blue. There's a lot of steps of escalation that I would say you should do before you get to an almost kiss, right? Are you doing eye contact? Are you doing quick grazing touches in non-intimate places? Are you doing more lingering touches? Are you moving from shoulder to small of back? Are you consistently getting yeses and buy-ins all the way through? I also teach how to do an almost handhold, which is a way of getting non-verbal consent to hold somebody's hand. Like all of these things are things that you can be doing to making sure that you're getting yes buy-in and buying excitement feedback they're 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 also meeting me and then maybe the almost kiss i would never say start with the almost kiss if you haven't touched anybody yet do not almost kiss the cashier <laughs> it's no, not appropriate do not it's not no. appropriate <laughs> great clarification thank you <laughs> i see this i'm 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 seeing like a party context you know, a soiree, dinner party or something, you meet somebody, there's some, there's flirting happen. There's multiple points of contact throughout the evening. Yes. Yes. Um, the, well, I, the last time I almost kissed, I was on a first date last week and, um, and it was like this really sweet escalation. We had dinner first. There was like lots of flirty conversation. We escalated non-verbally. We gave the affirmations and we did some three-part invites. And then, uh, and then I got the hand on the small of my back as we were walking. And then, you know, it just kind of sweetly escalated to that point. And it felt, it felt really nice. The, uh, the grazing, the lip grazing, who's going to cave first? Man, that is, <laughs> that stuff is gold. Uh -huh. I mean, it's really precious. Yeah, yeah. I ha yeah, I had a, uh, I had that last night actually with this this woman that I that I see every now and then. We hadn't seen each other in three months, and so we hadn't kissed in three months, and so it's like we had a first kiss again, uh -huh. including the energetic buy-in and including the like a two-part invitation. Mm -hmm. Actually, it was just a one-part invitation. It was, shall we kiss? <laughs> I like that. It's both of us, shall we? Like, uh, yes, we shall, or no, we sh we shouldn't. You know. Yeah. Uh, and that's sweet when you have a history with someone. Yeah, I remember being at a wedding last summer, and flirting with this with a beautiful woman. And at some point, I said something. It was a two part invitation. I said, you know, if you're if you're interested, I would really like to go make out in the woods with you. And she was like, I'm very interested. <laughs> uh -huh. So there was no three, there was no third part there. I think that if you have um, a pre-existing relationship with somebody, you don't always need that three part invite. But if you're ever not sure that somebody's going to feel comfortable saying no, or if there's something that's holding you back from being feeling safe to ask, having that three part invite can make that easier. Yeah, especially when you're, there, there might be like a professional context or yeah. some sort of relationship that could be at risk. Right. Of or like you don't a, know that they're available or that they're ready or maybe they express that they want to go at a slow pace and you're curious how it's feeling for them. You want to escalate, but you're not sure. Anytime that it feels like murky water, the three-part invitation is really helpful. I'm just reminded of this thing that I wrote that I was advocating for for a long time, less so now, but I still kind of use the, the general principles, which is I called it the one, two, three. Okay. And, and the one, two, three was, was um, devised at Burning Man because you're on a short time frame. Mm -hmm. And if, if you want to get laid at Burning Man, it, it could help to like speed things up a little bit. I mean, everything is sped up at Burning Man anyways, right? Like, 
a three hour date is like it was two weeks of a relationship with somebody. <laughs> so true. And so we came up with this this uh, this three part framework, let's say, which is basically I'm going to boil it down super simple. First part is some sort of compliment, an expression of interest. I used to say you're cute, but now it's more like uh, you're charming. Something that's not like physical based, you know, mm -hmm. expression of interest. Number two, are you single? That's another expression of interest. Mm -hmm. You've now completely removed yourself from this quote unquote friend zone. When you ask that question, your intentions are a lot more clear. That's right. And it gives, it gives somebody an out. They can say, actually, I'm not. Even if they are. I'm totally, I mean, it's like, that's totally fine. If, if I ask you if you're single, because I want to ask you out and, and you are single and you say, no, actually I'm not. I'm okay with that. I, I really like saying, are you available? I get uh, that because you live in the Bay area. And there's a lot of non-monogamous people. <laughs> yes. And, but if you're monogamous, maybe you do want to say, are you single? Uh, that makes sense to me. I get it because, but most people aren't don't live in the Bay area in like polycules and like they're not poly savvy. <laughs> and, and then I could just see people in Kansas being like, and no, no offense to people in Kansas who are poly and, and I'm not, this is not a dig on you, but there will be like, for what? <laughs> I see your point. There's like 350 million Americans plus like whoever listens to this podcast, like around the world. Uh, but at this point comes up often. People are like, oh, what about available? So that's why I say sometimes, like, are you single and or available? Got it. Okay. And if they say yes, then, it, then, then I'll go, <laughs> do you want to ride bikes and make out? <laughs> and that's for Burning Man because it's like, basically like, do you want to go on an adventure? Yeah. And maybe make out. Yeah. And someone could say, I would really want to ride bikes with you. But no, I don't really want to make out. And you're like, cool, let's go ride bikes. Yeah. Or I would just rather roll around in the dust with you and make dust angels. Or like, what's this bike business? Let's just make out. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Also, That's you right. you know I don't have a bike. What the fuck? <laughs> Find me a Burning Man, okay? <laughs> the one that I will. I probably will be there this year. The the one two three works. It works because it's clear and it's simple. And it gives people an out, mm -hmm. but the outs, and, and if they say, no, they say, no, I'm not single. And you could be like, oh, you know, my loss, I was going to ask you out on a date, but uh, instead I'll, we can just like, whatever, continue the conversation or part ways or. Yeah. Or I just say, um, your partner's a really lucky person because you're very, you're very compelling. Where'd you meet your partner? Yeah. Does your partner have a brother? Yeah. Where'd you, <laughs> yeah. Where'd you meet your partner? Instant pivot to a safe, neutral oh, yeah. conversation. Yeah. I, I really like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I forgot. I forgot about that. I remember I was in a grocery store once and I, and I was doing the one, two, three. Um, and this woman goes like, Oh no, unfortunately, like I have, I have a boyfriend. I'm like, Oh, that's cool. Where'd you guys meet? She goes, oh, she was like, literally that's how it was. Oh, cool. Where'd you guys meet? And she goes, oh, we met in college. And the dude fucking shows up like 10 seconds later from around the corner. And then I was like, oh, hey, cool. You're, you guys met in college. She was just telling me how you guys met in college. Awkwardness instantly dissipated. Yeah. And it could have been a really awkward situation. You know, dude yeah. hitting on his girlfriend in the grocery store. That's great. I'm going to suggest that to people. Thank you for that insight. That's great. <laughs> so welcome. This is, I love the collaborative effect that we're having on each other. Mm -hmm. Definitely. You've got a, a brain worth picking. <laughs> <laughs> um, we could obviously do this forever. And so I'm wondering if there, is there anything that we didn't touch on that would be really important for us to touch on? Well, I, just because it's one of my favorite things in the whole world, I, I want to say something about the difference between a compliment and an affirmation. Oh. Yeah. And because this is really great nonverbal flirting technique. So a compliment, uh, I'm sorry, pardon me, this is verbal flirting technique. A compliment is saying what you like about somebody. You have beautiful eyes. I really like how alive and expressive you are. 
I'm impressed by your success. Okay, those are all compliments. An affirmation, I say, is a compliment on steroids because it's so much more impactful. And when you give an affirmation, you're saying whatever it is that you like, and then you're saying how that thing that you like impacts you. And when you're sharing about the impact, that is an expression of vulnerability that can create more intimacy. Furthermore, people have a way of deflecting or arguing with or not believing compliments. But when you put it as an affirmation where you're sharing the impact, it makes it so much more believable and somebody can't argue with your experience. So instead of just saying you have a beautiful smile, maybe I'll say you have a beautiful smile and when you smile, my stomach starts to flutter. Or instead of saying um, you have such a interest, you have such in so many interesting things to say, I'd really like to pick your brain. I could say something like, you have so many interesting things to say. It makes me really curious about your life experiences and it has me really want to get to know you more. And that's talking about the impact. Hard to argue. Yeah. Hard for, you to, hard for me to say, you know, if I'm the type of person who can't take a compliment, for me, for me to say like, no, that's not true. That's right. And if you're the kind of person that has a hard time being vulnerable, it's a great way to start. Allie, I really love your openness and when i hear the way you talk it really inspires me to sort of like be more open myself mm -hmm. and when you say that to me i notice that my body relaxes and i feel closer to you can't wait to see you at burning man <laughs> <laughs> This was a fun podcast, Sean, I must say. <laughs> Yay! Our friend in common was not wrong. <laughs> That's right. Where can we find you? You do so many. You have like all these workshops. You, you've you got a lot going on. Where can we find you? If you go to my website, www.turnon.love, you can find out about all of my workshops and my coaching practice. My workshops are going to be going up online later this year. So you can join my mailing list to find out updates about that. And then if you go to the resources tab, there's a bunch of useful handouts there that you might find helpful. Um, and so I welcome you to check that out as well. And feel free to get in touch via email through my site. Which handout would you recommend for me? Oh, for you. There is a handout on there called uh, The Guide to My Pussy which comes from my how to eat pussy like a champ workshop. And it's like a mad libs for a pussy. And so the way that I would recommend that you use it is that you give a copy to a pussy that you enjoy playing with, whoever that person might be. And you fill out a copy about her pussy and she fills it out about her pussy. And then you two compare notes and you see how much do you really know what she likes and where are the areas that you can explore more together. Okay, challenge number one is going to be to find a pussy that I have that much experience with. <laughs> but uh -huh. I'll take I'll take you up on it. Or just do it Mad Lib style. Like I had this crazy guest on my podcast, and she told me about this handout. And can we fill it out together? Ooh, <laughs> that could be really fun. That's a power move on a first date, by the way. Maybe not a first date. Give it like <laughs> you know fourth or fifth. Oh uh, yeah, last question. I, th I feel like you're very well suited to answer this one. It's a bit of a curveball, but what does love mean to you? Hmm. I really love Bell Hooks and her book, All About Love. And she defines love as a action and a choice. It's how we treat one another. It's a intentionality and choosing to be vulnerable and hold somebody else's vulnerability like the gift that it is. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. It was a pleasure talking with you. Hey, that was awesome. <laughs>